Oh my gosh, welcome everybody. We're wow. so happy to be here and to see all of you. Um, if you don't know Rick Martinez, I'm sure you do. You will love him by the end of this demo that he's doing. Um, Rick is the author of the best-selling Mi Cocina, which is his fabulous cookbook that came out in May. And um, to write it, he traveled 25,000 miles in a car around Mexico. When I first read the brief, I thought it was a typo. I'm like, no, no, 2,500, 25,000. Rick, how did you, can you tell us about writing your book and how you managed to do that? I mean, I got to eat my way around the country. Like, I mean, let's be honest, it wasn't a hard trip. It, you know, it was very long, um, but it was, it was life-changing. You know, like I got to see the, the changing geography. I got to see the changing climate. I got to meet farmers. I got to meet, you know, chefs. I got to meet home cooks. And everyone was so warm and welcoming and generous and, and wanted me to try the things that they grew, the things that they made. I mean, it was, it was so beautiful. And I feel like so often when you travel, you know, you're flying into a city and you fly out. So right. you only see this one little spot. But to be able to drive and see the changing seasons, the changing geography, and, and to be able to taste those differences from city to city was extraordinary. How long did it take you? 25,000 miles? Well, I mean, there was this little thing called the pandemic. Um, so I started in 19, in, uh, in the fall of 19. Yep. I bought a car in Mexico City. I started driving around the center of the country. And my plan was to uh, hit the south, the central states, go up the Gulf Coast, across the north, and come back down. And I was in <laughs> the northern states in uh, March of 20, okay. when it got really bad in New York. And I was like, all right, I don't want to go to get, my, get stuck in New York in my apartment in Harlem. Yeah. So I'm going to go find a beach. So I drove to the coast and I thought, okay, I'll be here for a couple of weeks. The pandemic will pass and then I'll start driving again. That never happened. And then I ended up buying a house in Mazatlan and, and rescued a dog on the streets. And now, and now that's, that's, that's where your I live. home. That's yeah. your home. That's an amazing story. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so just tell us, though, a little bit about your background and your upbringing. So you grew up in Texas, and yes. your grandfather was the key to you and your Mexican identity and cooking? Yeah. So my, my grandparents, my grandfather and my grandmother, are from Torreon and Monterrey, which are both cities in the northern states. And, you know, like a lot of, of first, second, and third generation immigrants, my parents, who were born in Texas, wanted to be as, you know, quintessentially yeah. American as possible. And so... They didn't teach me or my brother Spanish because they feared that... Oh, you're that, kidding. So you didn't no, even grow up speaking Spanish. I did not know Spanish because they, they were scared that either we would be held back in school, we would be made fun of, or, you know, something would happen. And so we didn't know Spanish. In fact, most of my Spanish comes from living in the country and then just, you know, talking and interacting with people. But, you know, we were, we were very Texan. We were very, you know, mid-century American. My mother had a 1963 edition of Betty Crocker cookbook. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, we, we ate fried chicken, and we, we smoked briskets. And, you know, we, we ate Tex-Mex food. But at the time, growing up in Texas in the 70s, I thought that that was typical Mexican food, not Tex-Mex, you know, not even yeah. Mexican-American we were labeled by the people around us as Mexican, the Mexican family in an all-white neighborhood. And so I just thought, okay, well, then I'm, I'm a representative of all Mexicans. Right. And when I actually got into Mexico, I started traveling in my 20s into Mexico. And, you know, there was a point where I called my mom, like the first time I went to Mexico City, and I was like, this is nothing like what we ate. People don't look like us. People don't look like our family. Yeah. And none of the food that I ate growing up was represented here. Like, so I don't understand who are we? What are we? Yeah. And that was really where this idea came from for me that I just needed to go and explore who I was. My, my grandfather retained his love for the country. He came to the United States when he was five. They bought a dairy farm in central Texas and, and he grew up in, in Texas. And, you know, and, and he made fairly frequent visits to Mexico when he was in his 20s. Um, and he retained this love of the country. And, and, you know, he became a full citizen of the U.S. And he was very politically active here. Yep. Um, I actually met him on several political rallies, you know, growing up. Yep. He, he and I both marched for Ann Richards when she uh, won the governorship in, in Texas. But, and you he know, showed you how to... And he sh yes. yes. Ann Richards! <laughs> Um, and he showed you really, like, you have some stories that you were telling about how he brought, he showed you 
um, the, the Mexican food that he loved. He would take you to church festivals, and he'd be there with the mariachi band, and you would come and meet him. And Yeah, I always knew where to find him. And it was like, I mean, let me just paint the scene. So my grandfather at that time was about 85 years old. He would call my mom and say, okay, tell Ricky that I'm going to be here, here, and here at these times. If he wants to meet me, fine. So I, was, I just turned 16. I would go. And these were literally like circuit parties for Mexican-Americans and Mexican immigrants. And so you'd go to these church festivals, and there's mariachis, and there's drinking, there's tacos, there's, you know, uh, uh, like barbecue, Tex-Mex food. And invariably, he would have already had a few Lone Stars. He had a gordita in one hand, a beer in the other, and was just belting out, you know, <laughs> mariachi songs. Oh, my God. Amazing. And, and you then know, how, do you, how do you not love that? How do you not oh fall in love with, right? No, I, mean, I was <laughs> like, I want more of this. I want to know what you know. And I would just, like, I would just absorb all of these stories from him. Amazing. And so, okay, let's get to, we got to get to the oh, cooking. Yeah, yeah. Let's get to the cooking. And let you are going to show us how to make one of the many different kinds of moles. Do you want to, before we start cooking, can you just give us a little, um, like a 101, a mole 101. Yeah. Because I think we think we know what it is. But. Right. I think, you know, the way to think of moles is it is a mother sauce in Mexico. And so there are an infinite number of variations, regional variations, family variations, even personal cook variations. And I think that, you know, unfortunately in this country, I think we believe that there is one correct way to make any particular type of dish, in particular moles. Yeah, I think it's this sort of this idea of authenticity, which we're trying to get, which doesn't necessarily exist. It doesn't exist. Yeah. You know, there are techniques, and there are things that moles have in common. Right. So moles being a mother sauce, they're used for a number of different things, but the thing that they have in common is chili. So either dried or fresh, sometimes yep. both. And also the, the type of chili varies from the location that you're making it in, and also the, the personal flair and the creativity of the cook that's making it. But... You know, everything else you can sub in and out. There are also techniques like either charring to develop flavor yep. or uh, roasting or toasting in lard. Um, sometimes incinerating like a mole negro, you really have to like just completely blacken a lot of the ingredients until they almost resemble uh, charcoal. Right. Um, which is just, you know, it's something, I think that is something which uh, many cooks who haven't, who aren't familiar with it, they stop short, right? Yeah. 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 And I think that, you know, the other thing, that, the other misconception is not all, not all moles have chocolate, uh, not all moles are sweet, um, and not all moles have, you know, 50 ingredients. You can make a 10-ingredient mole with what you have in your pantry, um, but, you know, what, is, what needs to be in there are dried or fresh chilies. Okay, and so can you just walk us through the different... So oh, first tell us the name of the mole we're going to make today, and then walk us through the chilies. Okay. So this mole is called Coloradito. It is from Oaxaca. It is, so Oaxaca is famous for having seven sort of mother types of, of moles. And so this is one of the seven. Um, the mole negro is actually my favorite, but I put this in the book because it is very common and it's slightly easier for an American home cook to make because the, the mole negro has a chili chilhuacle, which is very difficult to source. It's also very expensive. It's here at Calustian's, uh, but it is about $30 a bag. Do you have it in your book? Is there a recipe for it? Oh, the recipe's up for it. And the new, so we have, we're going to talk about this in a second. In the essentials um, at NYT Cooking, Rick has a fantastic package called the Essentials of Mexican Cuisine, and that recipe is there. So yes. we're not going to be making it, but if you're curious, you can find it online. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that was really important to me in the book is I didn't want you to have to buy specialty ingredients. I didn't want you to have to buy specialty equipment. And so for all of the recipes in my book, but particularly the mole, you can sub out different things that you might have in your pantry already. So if you don't have almonds, for example, you can use pecans. If you don't have chili ancho, you can use uh, chili guajillo. Just w what is key is using um, the gram amount. So if you don't have 60 ah, grams so of... so it's the scale. So it's, it's the scale, particularly for the chilies, because the chilies act as a thickener for the sauce. So instead of using six chili ancho, which my chili anchos are going to be probably larger than yours, um, and they might be fresher because I'm in Mexico, you should just use the gram amount, and you'll get the proper thickness of the mole. Okay, I just am curious. How many of you guys have scales at home? I Yay! love you. Oh, yes, my God. Go you. Love this crowd. Mwah. Okay, you are, you are the best, so that is great. Yes. I'm um, in the rest of you. You can get one for about $30, so now might yeah. be the time. Um, yeah. All right, so... Take us through the chilies that we're going to use for the coloradito today. 
Okay, so we're going to be using um, so chili ancho is one of my favorite, and when it's fresh, it should actually resemble something more like a dried apricot. It should be soft. It should be pliable. A little sweet. A little sweet. Hot, sweet a little hot. meaty. Yeah. A little bit smoky. Um, they're absolutely amazing. And so then, chili uh, wajillo are sort of this red brick color. They add like a really kind of a sharper flavor, a little more earthy, um, and then this beautiful color, which is also another reason why this uh, particular mole has the name Colorado or Coloradito. Oh, because of the color. Because it has this. And brick you guys red can color. see this, right? Can you see it up on the screen? Just this beautiful, ruddy. Yeah, yeah. If I show no. it to you, do you? See, <laughs> are you guys seeing it? Also matches the nails. It matches his <laughs> nails. Okay. Well, that better. Okay. Excellent. There we go. And then a lot of the moles in Oaxaca also use pasilla, uh -huh. um, sometimes morita, sometimes cascabel. Morita are uh, smoked, dried jalapenos. Morita. And okay. then cascabeles are, um, they're spicy uh, peppers. They, they sort of look like a cherry pepper. Um, they are very spicy. So small. They're small. Um, yep. They look like little bells. They also, uh, they get their name from the, the sound when, they, when they're dried. The, the seeds sort of rattle on the inside of them. Oh, okay. Got yeah. it. Yep. So, okay, yeah. well, here's a question for you. Uh -huh. So how long do these chilies keep when they're dried? Like if, you know, do we need to worry about freshness when we're talking about these? Is it important to find a store with a good turnover? Um, what if you happen, not that I know anyone who ha who's, who's like this, but what if you happen to have a few bags in your cabinet from like 2018? Um, can I use them or do I need to throw them out? I mean, you know, so my general rule for anything in my pantry is like it goes in in January, it goes out in December. Like it. I would like, I, I write labels okay. on it. I mean, whether it. it's like yep. cinnamon, yep. cumin, whatever. Um, okay, because, I'm going you know, to empty it. I'm going to start fresh. You're going you're gonna to lose the, the <laughs> yeah. freshness of it. Yeah. I mean, so to me, like what I would do when I lived in the U.S. and yeah. the chilies weren't great, yeah. I would find, you know, you want something pliable. Something like this that snaps and is dry and crumbly, that's bad. Oh, wait, that's bad? Yeah, well, I mean, we're, this, about, we're about to use it. Okay, but. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, because let's be honest. Okay, this is what you're gonna find. I mean, when I lived here, this is what you know you're used to, and so you make do. I would smell them. This does actually have a decent aroma, but you know it's dry and brittle. Well, but this one, look. That one's a little bit that more bendy. That one's a little better. Yeah. Okay, so we're looking for bendy. Yeah, but like, yeah. So this is a little bit better, um, but if you go to the grocery store, oh, this one's good. And the dry and crispy, the only ones that you find, it's probably going to be, it, it will probably have been on the shelf for a long period of time, and you're not going to get as rich of a flavor as, as you it, would. It's still going to taste good, right? It's still going to taste good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because um, so, we want everyone to make this. Yes. So what I would do is, if you don't use all the chilies that you buy, you can actually store them either in an airtight container in your, your cupboard, or if they're super fresh, what I would recommend is putting them in a zipper bag a Ziploc bag and put them in the freezer. Okay. And they'll That's keep a like a full year in the freezer. Whatever whatever uh, uh, moisture that they have will be preserved in the freezer. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let us just go. I just want to point out a couple of other interesting ingredients here, um, like the animal crackers. So talk about what, so this is not a, um, an intuitive thing. Tell me yeah. about, yeah. So the animalitos or the animal crackers are actually pretty common both in Puebla uh -huh. and Oaxaca. So Puebla and Oaxaca are two states in Mexico that they, they claim that this is where mole originates. Now, mole exists every part of the country. Like, every state that I've been in, they have their own regional versions of mole. So, but those two states are known for different types of mole. In, in Oaxaca, you have the seven different types. Right. In, um, in Puebla, you have mole poblano, um, which comes from the city of Puebla. Uh, but animal crackers are used not only for a little sweetness, but also for a little body and a little bit of thickness. And so in this case, we're going to fry them in, in some of the lard with the other ingredients. Um, they'll get a little nutty, and, toasty yeah. flavor. And then they're just going to add like a really small back note of nuttiness and sweetness. Okay, well, should we, should we start? Let's start. All right. Okay. All right. So, so okay, you're going to put me to work, right, if we need? Yeah, so first we're going to like, let's, let's turn these guys on. Let's just crank them up. Okay. Um, so it'll take a minute for them to heat up. Okay. So we've got all our ingredients here. And... What, so, I mean, so mole, you were talking about how mole, it's, it's ingredient driven, but it's really about the techniques, right? And the techniques yes. are unusual for um, if you're not used to cooking moles or Mexican cuisine. So talk us through a little bit about what this particular techniques for mole are. Okay, so I think the biggest techniques are toasting, 
and either sauteing or, or shallow frying or charring. So that's really how, you know, th these are the fundamental te techniques of all Mexican cuisine. So in particular, moles, you're just building layers and layers of flavor. Right. And so in this particular case, we're going to use a couple of those different techniques, and, and it makes a huge difference. You know, and like, when I was learning how to make moles with different people that I was meeting, these are, like, taking a really long time. <laughs> um, when I was meeting with people and cooking in their homes, yep. um, you know, like, this is the way that they've made it, and I'm, I'm taking notes, I'm recording on my phone, and I'm wondering, like, is this step really necessary? Like, there is one step that is in this recipe that I, I really tried to, not, to get around. Okay, what's, it's a the, little... what's the step? So, okay, after you blend, you, you've fried everything, you've toasted everything, you've simmered it, it's soft, you blend it. Yeah. So now it's, it's a, a thick a liquid. Thick puree, yep. Yeah. And every, every mole recipe then fries it. Right? Fries the, okay, the, right, the liquid. in lard. So you're yeah, taking yeah. the puree and you're frying it in lard. What does that do? Why is that so essential? Well, and so I, I experimented to see what that did because I didn't really understand and no one could really tell me. They just like, this is what you do. Like, right. you need to do this. Right. And so I, did, I made moles with, I made without. Yep. And what I found is that a couple of things happen. So you get your pan roaring hot and... Yeah, yeah, this one's... Okay, right, so now let's, let's okay. just start dumping all the dry things. Got so it. we're going to start with cumin and oregano and uh, thyme and pepitas. Pepitas, so... And uh, clove, one clove. Sesame seed, allspice, peppercorn. Two little allspice berries. Makes a big difference. Moles are all about balance. And so you want a little bit of sweet. You want some spice. Please. Um, and that's really the key. But again, this one is obviously a... There are a lot of ingredients in here, but it doesn't have to be. Like, you can actually make very simple moles, reduce down the number of seeds, only use one seed, only use one nut, only use one type of chili, and you'll be fine. Can you hand me the lard? I sure can. Um, I love using lard, by the way. Anybody that knows me, you don't have to use lard. So you um, could use vegetable oil or you like could a... Use vegetable yeah. oil, avocado oil, a nut oil. You could use schmaltz. Uh, which I actually made a, a mole yesterday with oh my schmaltz, gosh, which you're I talking adore. Talking to my heart, schmaltz. I've schmaltz. Got oh my god! Fridge full of schmaltz. Exactly. You can use beef tallow. You. The thing that I love about using animal fats is obviously the richness. Yep. But also in Mexico, when you're cooking, um, when you're making chicharrones, when you're making uh, carnitas, yeah. The the residual leftover is the lard. And so it's a really great way of using the entire animal through the entire cooking process. Right. And I mean, and just, you just can't get that flavor anywhere else. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So what goes in the lard? Okay. So the lard, we're going to toast the, um, the chiles. Okay. Um, I'm going to throw this in. I think it's also been, already been toasted, but we're going to get a little bit more color on it. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So we want color. We want aroma. And that's another thing about moles. You're cooking with all of your senses. So it's like the smell, the sight. Um, <laughs> And, you know, you can tell when I something can is... I smell it here. You guys can't smell it. Can you? Front row? Maybe a little bit? No? Okay. <laughs> it's like all of the, the aromas are waking up. Like, yeah. so all of the, the spices in there, the thyme leaves, they're all just sort of like waking up and saying good morning. That's exactly what we want. Okay. And we're just going to let that keep melting. Okay. Um, right. Oh, you know, Rick, you were talking about, so the step where you fry the puree. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you tried it with, you tried it without. What was the missing? What, what so does it do? you get your pan roaring hot right. with the lard or yeah. some oil. And then when you pour it in, this is the part that I couldn't understand. Like, you're dropping liquid into hot, hot fat. Hot fat, right. You know, like, it's, you're going to make a mess. Right. What is happening in there? So when it's that, when the, the, the oil is that hot, you're actually deeply caramelizing really quickly. Like, you're sealing all the flavor in. It also, as it starts to boil, so you yep. pour everything in, it, it goes yep. crazy, and it, starts, it goes back down to a simmer. It helps with the emulsification process. So there are oils in the chiles. There are oils in the nuts. There are oils in the plantains. There are obviously, we're, There's we're cooking put it, oil. Right, you're going to put more fat in. And that step actually just binds everything together. I see. And, and even the chocolate, like, it just becomes so much more velvety and unctuous. Um, with doing that step. And, and if so you it, miss that step, you're going to miss out on that the extra flavor, the, t the it's, silky it's gonna, texture. It's going to be a little bit thinner. The, the, the flavors aren't going to, like, seem as cohesive. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so, so we're, we're kind of melty there. So let's go ahead and just throw... I'm going to do, do want, half of them. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, I don't know if I have tongs anywhere. 
Yes, uh, we do. Yay. Okay. So, thank you. This is a little tepid, but the idea here is that we want to get color. Um, we want to, again, wake up the aromas. It should be sizzling. You can also see the oil is changing yeah, can color. Can you guys see? Can you see into the pans? Can you see that the otherwise I can hold it up? I don't know if you can. Yeah. Yeah, you can see it. Okay, Yay, great. great. Yeah, you can see that. The, so the oil's taking on the flavor. The chilies are getting toasted. We can smell that from here. Yeah. These are nice and toasty. Do these just stay here? Or do you want me to move these? Um. Yeah, we can like go ahead and take these out. All yep. right. So that is now done. Okay. So actually, you know what? What can I do? Um, let's go ahead and we'll use the same skillet. Uh, you want to toast these? You yep. can also dry toast the chilies. Oh, perfect. Okay. And the same thing, we just want to, if you dry toast them, this is another technique um, in sauce development or flavor development in Mexican cuisine. Oftentimes, you'll have a big comal, which is basically like a large griddle. It can be made of, of metal. It can be made of clay. And you'll toast nuts and seeds and chiles um, on an open fire. You'll get a little bit of the smokiness. What, what about the grill? Could you use it? Could you ever do this on a grill? Oh, like just 100%. the toasting. You could do it. Okay, so if you all have grills out there, um, the good thing about doing this on a grill is I would imagine that it would keep. I mean, I think this gets pretty smoky, right? Yes. Yeah. So you want to keep that outside. Yeah, and the uh, the mole negro recipe, um, I actually say like if you have a grill, this is the time to use it. Perfect. Because that smoke can be really, really noxious. In fact, there are parts of the Yucatan. There's a dish in the Yucatan called relleno negro. And it is like it is completely black, and you you basically incinerate all the ingredients in it, and the smoke is so powerful because you're using so many chilies that in some parts of the Yucatan it's actually illegal to make it. Oh my gosh! And you you have to have polluted. a license yeah. and a professional hood wow. to like deal with all of the smoke. Okay, so what happens to these once they're nice and toasty? Um, we're just going to throw them in the bowl and see. Okay. So you can see this one. Now we're getting like this beautiful color. Yep. We've got like that beautiful oil. You want to just throw those in there? Yep. Uh, save the oil. No, just to, yeah. We're going to use this now chili flavored oil. Oops. Ah, chili, come back. <laughs> chili, come back. Come back. Okay. And now we're yep. going to toast or uh, fry all of these things. Okay. So these okay. are, so you have tomatoes. So I have tomatoes. These are um, plantains. Plantains. Which are very, as you can see, they're super ripe. We've got some onions and garlic. And the garlic is whole and that's okay? Yeah. That's what you want? So we're going to blend all of these ingredients are going to get simmered and blended until they're really smooth. So again, this step is just all about like getting the, the color and the flavor, building those layers. The tomatoes, um, oftentimes in, in moles, you can char them. Right. So using the same comal or skillet. And then you would do keep them whole or you would have them and how, or you just do, whole. Whole. Okay, yeah. so whole tomatoes charred. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the things that is very common in the Mexican kitchen is a blender. And honestly, like that's the only, like the only piece of special equipment that you need um, for my book. Do we have um, one? No, we're good. We're uh, gonna... Yeah, they're going to have that blend, pre-blended for right, us. We're going to do a little swap for you. So we're not going to bother you with the blender noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, like, and you don't need a fancy blender. You just need something that can actually like blend all of this stuff. So moles are pre-Hispanic. And so what was done before the use of blenders and before the Europeans came, um, there are pieces of volcanic rock that are flat that have what look like a, a rolling pin. And you would grind all the nuts and the seeds and the chilies on that. I mean, have, I'm sure there are places where that's still done, where it's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, And do you feel like that is somehow inherently better than using the blender? Or do you think it's the same? I mean, I don't think it's any better. I mean, I think it's, you know, like when someone is using that, to me, you see that person and you think that person is making this dish with an extraordinary amount of love. Yeah. Right? And so I am going to taste the love in that dish because, you know, moles are very complicated. And if you're actually willing to grind all of this up by hand, there is a dedication there that, you know, me and my blender probably right. aren't going to have. <laughs> Although you could also have lots of love and you could love the no blender. i mean I, blender, no trust yeah, me yeah, yeah. I, there's <laughs> lots of love in me and my, me and my vitamix so <laughs> um so what are you looking for here what are you when do you know this is going to be done um we're going to cheat this a little bit i would let this go for about 10 minutes okay. until everything is like really nice and soft okay 
Um, but you can, I mean, it smells incredible. Yeah. You have like this chili flavored oil. I know. And if now, I were home, I would just take plantains out and eat them. So it's a good thing that we're. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the plantains can either be like, I mean, here it's a little difficult at times to get, you know, really ripe plantains. Yes. A lot of times you buy them and then you throw them in a paper bag and let them yeah. go for a couple of days. I don't know if you guys notice, look how black yeah, yeah. those are. That's, and that's correct. Yeah. All right. And does that also go with the, um, with the does it all get blended together? Yeah. Okay. So, so literally all the ingredients are going to just like simmer down with the stock and then we will blend them all together. So why don't we, I'm going to push this all to the side. Okay. And we can just throw in all of these ingredients. Okay. So we've got our, I'm going to hand them to you. We've got okay. our bay leaf and our, this is a star anise. Star anise. Which I, I really love the flavor of star anise in moles. I'm not a, not a huge star anise person, like just generally, but in this mole, it like, it adds a lot. Okay, cinnamon, cinnamon stick, stick, our little animal little crackers. Little animal crackers, which and then I love. These are, so these are raw peanuts, right? Because yep. we're toasting them now. Right. So we're just doing double duty in here. We're and then the sugar everything. comes later? Yeah. So here we have, uh, this is light brown sugar. Right. In the recipe I call for either piloncillo, which is Mexican. Uh, it's basically in the refinement process when um, sugar cane is being processed. Yep. The residual uh, or the leftovers is like a really thick, almost molasses-like yep. uh, syrup that is then dried, and that becomes piloncillo, which is really, really delicious. All right, I'm going to get, we don't need this anymore, right? No. And then we're going to put, we're going to cheat out our mole, and we're going to put it. Yes. I'm going to get start getting this hot, because okay. we're going to fry our mole in this, right? That's, yep. And so do just, we have another lard? Um... We don't have another lard. All right, so did we use double the amount of lard in there? And we might have. So we'll just we'll transfer you know? that. You know, I have you been know? accused of using a lot of lard in my time. <laughs> but maybe we're going to use a little less lard. All right, so then what should we do here? Um, do we have any... If there's a fairy... Is there any, any oil um, a lard or lard? A fairy or a, the oil fairy who could maybe bring otherwise, us a little... Otherwise, we we're will gonna, just use this oh, oil. Oh, we'll just use that. Okay. Yeah, okay. So if we'll not, just do that. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So if you Here, could I'm gonna grab hold. a spoon. Oh, you know what? There's a strainer right there. Ha -ha. Brilliant. This is cooking on the fly. All right. So if you ever add too much lard, this is what This you is do. what you can do. So normally, though, so the idea here, though, we were just talking about, you're getting the lard super hot. Yeah. And then we're going to fry the sauce in that. Yes. Okay. I can't believe no one's bringing us any additional oil or lard. They're trying to keep our, our they're trying to keep us from, you know, over larding it up. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm pro-lard. I'm pro I would. I, I would. am so pro-lard. Okay. You and I, we both love that. We love the animal fats. Yes. Okay. So we're going to get that little guy out. All right. And I'm going to, all right. So, so now we're going to put all of this goes back in the pot. All of our nuts and seeds and chilies. Yeah. And then, oh, here's the extra lard. Oh, God. Never on that mind. side. Oh, well. Now we have extra, extra lard. It all goes to the same place. Exactly. It's all going to be delicious. <laughs> What's all that? Did we This is something? the chocolate. Okay, that ad comes at salt. the end, right? Yeah. Okay. okay, great. So this is going to get our stock. And so you're simmering all of this because you want it to get super soft. And this is just vegetable stock? Uh, this is a chicken stock. Chicken stock, yeah. okay. But you can use whatever stock that you have. You can even, honestly, you can use uh, water as well. Just there. All right, and so that is um, a tortilla which has been toasted already, right? Yeah, yeah. And this is getting hot. Oh, I'm going to put this in and there brown as sugar. well. And so how long, we're going to cheat it, obviously, but how long would this take, so a half an hour? This or? goes half an hour uncovered. Okay. okay. Um, we're going to evaporate some of, the, uh, some of the liquid from the stock. By that point, you know, your cue here is it will smell absolutely incredible. All of these aromas are going to come together. The chili should be yep. really, really soft and pliable, and it should be very easy for your blender to blend everything. And unlike, I think, a lot of... Blend uh, everything in batches. Everything in batches. Like, yep. unless you have, like, a giant blender, um, it, you know, it's better, it's safer to, to blend it in batches. But um, like uh, a lot of curries... All of the spices, all of the herbs, everything is getting blended. So we're not pulling anything out. Like that whole cinnamon stick, the whole anise, all the nuts, everything gets blended. Okay, so that will come up to a boil. And so now that we have all this lard going, we have our pre-blended chili paste. So this is what it looks like after you've cooked this down, you've blended it. It's this really, really nice, beautiful paste. 
You've got that beautiful color. And when your lard is smoking, okay, so this is like... Just check, just checking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is the part where we stand back. Oh, okay, got it. So now I'm standing back, but you're going to have to... Yeah, and oh, so... Oh, you know what? Hey, can I just do this? Or Sometimes I do this. Oh, look at that. Yeah, But I'm going to so... put this on you because look what you're wearing. It's beautiful. Can I just do this, Rick? Okay. Did you... I, you guys haven't felt this, <laughs> but this is the softest, most beautiful thing in the world, and I don't want it to get splattered. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> My God, what an honor I'm being dressed by Melissa Clark. <laughs> um, so again, this is one of those things. Okay. It's going gonna, it's gonna to splatter. This is where you want long sleeves. You want to have the apron. And the, the best thing to do, don't, like, you just go with it. Just pour the whole thing in. Don't, like, go slow. <laughs> don't be sheepish. Just do this and go. All right. Oh, that wasn't so bad. Okay, there we go. Yeah. There, see? Okay, and you, um, and you guys are seeing into the pot, or do I need to hold it up? You are seeing it. Okay, great. Because you can see it's already starting to simmer. The second that he throws that in, it is simmering. It's coming alive. Yeah. Right, okay. For you. And so now, this is a point where you really need to stand here and stir, incorporate everything in. So are you trying to re-emulsify this? Yeah, it will come back in. Yeah. I am... What I do you need? It's a little thick. I want to... A little water? Yeah, a little, little, little water. Here, okay. Here's a picture. And depending on your ingredients, and also, like, I assume this has been sitting out for a bit, it might be a little thick. You want this to be the consistency of, of heavy cream. Tell me when to stop. Okay. Okay, that's good. And it should be really, really nice and smooth. My God, it smells... You, I wish you can smell. We need to figure out how to get the smell out to you. Yeah. Well, and the taste. Like, we should pass out little bowls. <laughs> next year. Next yes, year. Yes, next year. Um, yeah. But everybody's going to go home and make this because you can see it's actually not that hard. It's, I mean, it's steps, but it's not, none of the steps are hard steps. Yeah. And actually, I have a mole sencillo recipe. It's a 10-ingredient mole. All the ingredients are things that you would have in your pantry. Right. Um, or you could like easily go to the grocery store and get. And you know, the thing about that recipe, it, it's really about teaching you the techniques. Right. Because once you get the technique down, you can add 50 ingredients, you can do it in 10, um, you can start swapping things out. The mole I made yesterday was actually, I mean, it was sort of a, not really a joke, but it was to demonstrate the idea that you can make a mole anywhere, right? And so this... Where were you? I was here. Oh, okay. So I swapped out like ingredients, you know, that... You, are commonly used in Mexico for things that you would commonly find here. So because I love Italian plums in, the, in place of tomatoes, I use Italian plums. Oh, my God. I brilliant. use shallots, dates in place of raisins. I used a black and white cookie instead of animal crackers. Yes. I um, love that. And, you know, and it, it was really, really good. And what did you do for the chilies? Because you had to have chilies. So the, you had to I, have I, chilies. Yeah, the, that I kept the same. So yeah. I did ancho and cascabel and some guajillos. But everything else... Well, and I also use schmaltz, which oh, I have to say, I love, I love yeah, a good love schmaltz mole. I love that you're using, um, you know, yeah, my yeah. food here, the black and white cookies, the schmaltz. Okay, All right, so, so we're going to add, and do you need to season this with a little salt? Yes, I am going to, actually, I'm going to, do we have tasting spoons? What? Do we have, we do have tasting spoons somewhere. I mean, I'm going to find okay. them while you put that in. All right. I, I know they brought us out I'm going to season this aggressively. Now, where would they be? And the Maybe chocolate, um... You can use a number of different types of chocolate. Um, in Mexico, people, it, it, it really varies. I don't even yeah. know that there's necessarily a typical chocolate that is used. In Tabasco, um, a lot, the state, of, the state of Tabasco, which is in the, on the Gulf Coast, they grow a lot of cacao. And so the chocolate there is really, really beautiful. And so there, a lot of times, the chocolate that goes into the moles is actually like a bittersweet or a dark or a completely unsweetened chocolate. Um, in Oaxaca, you actually go, there are like little, I don't even know how, how to describe it, there are like little stands that sell chocolate paste. And so you go what, in. What do you mean, what's a chocolate paste? So they sell cacao and they roast the cacao like coffee beans. Oh, so before it's conched into chocolate, it's and just And so the, you I'm go saying, in yeah. and you say, okay, I would like a kilo of cacao and 25% almonds, 25% sugar, and 10% cinnamon, and whatever other spices and herbs you want to add in, and they will literally, like, grind it for you. 
and then just hand you a bag of paste. Oh my God, amazing. And so that is That's what often, yeah, it's, the smell is insane. You're walking down the street and you get this freshly ground cinnamon and almond and chocolate smell. It's ridiculous. Right, and is that, would that, is that considered done yet? Or here, um, that's a spoon. Ooh, that's really good. Is that I'm good? put a little bit more salt. Okay. Okay. And then we can we can plate it up. We can show people how to plate it up. Yes, yes. So is that of the right amount of time? Or are we cheating this? I mean, right we're now? cheating this a little bit. How long would this normally take? This would go about ten minutes. Okay. Um, but so, the chocolate is pretty much all melted. So I think we're I think we're good. All right. So if you were going to plate this, do you want the tongs? Yes. All right. Uh, this is the way that I like serving this. I like doing half chickens. And this is just a roasted like a, you could even use a rotisserie chicken. Yeah. Yeah. And rotisserie chicken, rotisserie chicken stands are very, very common in Mexico. Here, wait, do you want a spoon? Do you have a ladle? I have or? this. Okay, excellent. All right. All right. All right. My God, that's so beautiful. Yeah. This color, oh my God. So the color, Dito, this is this like rich red color as opposed to the black color of the, right, the right. negro. And the, the colors of the mole in, in Oaxaca are so beautiful. So there's a red, there's a green, there's a yellow. The yellow one is really beautiful because it's, it's served more like a stew, and it actually has masa dumplings, Ooh, kind of like oh, a matzo ball good. or, you know, like yeah. a chicken and dumplings in yeah. the south. So good. Okay. So that's your serving. So that's, that's me? Okay, good. Because <laughs> I didn't have breakfast, let me tell you. Yeah. Um, All right, well, here, and, let's do one. And uh, is it? Yeah. And so then we're just going to do a little, so little sesame sprinkle seeds. of toasted sesame seeds on top. That's gorgeous. Yeah. And, you know, don't be stingy with the mole. Like, this is, this is the dish. The mole is the sauce. So, you know, the chicken is just... The chicken it's giving is you, just, like, it could be anything. Like, exactly. Like, like, it's also great on roasted vegetables, fish. And then would you do rice and beans on the same plate, or you'd keep them separate? We'll keep them separate. We're going to keep them yeah, separate. Yeah. All right. Should we, we get go to in? eat? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Provecho. What's the proper response to that? Uh, you just take a bite of food. Okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. Honestly, I've been like, seriously, I've been waiting all, I know, like I'm for like so weeks excited. for this moment. Because when I first found out that Rick was coming, I was like, yes. Cheers. Cheers. Oh my God. Mm. That's so mm. good. Mm. Rick, mm. can I take the rest of that home? Of course. <laughs> Wait, before we go, I just want to ask you a couple of questions about mm -hmm. storing mole. Okay. So, I'm going to, yep, sorry, get, get a napkin. Over. I know, because we're making a mess here. <laughs> Can you tell us about storing mole? Because that makes a lot. It does make a lot. So what I do, I just keep it in the freezer. Like, so whatever's left. Right. Um, and here's the thing about mole. So a lot of times the recipes are written like this, where you serve it over a roasted thing. Yep. Um, what I love doing is making, I don't know if you, if you guys know chilaquiles. Yep. You can make molaquiles. Oh, but here, talk, tell them, just in case someone doesn't know, what is chilaquiles? So chilaquiles is one of the ways that Mexicans use up um, leftover tortillas or, um, or totopos, which are like corn chips. And so what you do, or what I do, is I'll take my sauce, in this case a mole, and you basically just heat it up in a skillet, throw in your corn chips, toss it until everything is completely coated, add vegetables, salsa, um, you know, if you have any meat or protein, add that. Crema. Yep. It's like super delicious. Like molequiles are literally my absolute favorite thing in the universe. Oh my gosh, I want to make that so um, good. And you don't need cheese for that, right? No. You, I mean, basically put whatever, top, put right. a fried egg on it. It's, yeah. You just um, need the mole. Emboladas. So it's like an enchilada, but again, using this, uh, the mole as the sauce. So instead of, you know, making a, an enchilada sauce, all you do is take your tortilla, dip it in the mole, and then fill it with whatever filling you want. In um, Molas. Oh my God, amazing. All right, well, Rick, thank you so oh my much. God, you are you. the best. Uh, this was so fun. Thank you so much. I wish it's you so could taste fun. this. This is fantastic. And um, everybody, we're going to be signing books. I'm, I don't know where we're going to be signing books. Where are we going to be signing yeah. books? Somewhere. Somewhere back out there. there. <laughs> I see. We're going to be signing books. Okay, over there. There. There's Yay. somebody waiting. Oh. Signing books I'll be over there. there. Rick is going to be signing his fantastic, best-selling meat cocina. Everybody, you should go say hi to Rick. I'll be there signing my book, Dinner in One. Can't wait to see you. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Mwah.